Uh, let's go to God in prayer first. Gracious God, thank you for a magnificent, beautiful day in Rock Hill, South Carolina. All the mastery of the blue sky, of the leaves turning, of all the colors being so vibrant this morning. Even a, a chill in the air that we haven't seen before. We know fall is on its way. Like a good father, you have provided all things for us. You take care of us as a loving father would. Now this morning we come to worship you. We come to honor and praise your name as only you deserve. We come to hear your word as it was given to us so long ago, it's still relevant to us today. And so we just ask you, Father, if you would, bless our efforts to worship you this morning. Holy Spirit, come into me that the words that I say today, not my words, but may they be yours. Holy Spirit, come into the congregation this morning and be a part of who we are that we can truly worship you this morning. Uh, as we cast our cares and concerns out the door today, Father, may we just focus totally on you and your love for us. Thank you for the many visitors that we have today, too. It's such a blessing to have so many uh, new folks come today, and, and we just ask you to guide them, strengthen them, and be with them, each and every one of them. You know their needs, and we're just thankful, Lord, that uh, they have come to be with us today. So guide us now, we ask you, and just be with us as we worship you through hearing your spoken word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you want to worship. Our scripture reading this morning as we continue in our study in, the, in Proverbs. Uh, we're looking at Proverbs 3, verses 19 through 27 this morning. So if you would, stand with me as we hear God's word spoken to us. Here's where the writer, Solomon, writes to us. As he wrote to his son many years ago, The Lord, by wisdom, founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the deeps broke open and the clouds dropped down the dew. My son, do not lose sight of these. Keep sound wisdom and discretion, and they will be life for your soul and adornment for your neck. Then you will walk on your, on your way securely, and your foot will not stumble. If you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Do not be afraid of sudden terror or the ruin of the wicked when it comes, for the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to do it. The grass withers, the flowers fade away, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. Amen, congregation? Amen. 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 Thank you all. You may be seated. This is another one of those days where you're sitting up front and you see you just got a few people and then all of a sudden you get up here and it's like, whoa, where'd they all come from? But it's good to see everybody here this morning. I'm very, very glad you're here on such a beautiful day to worship our Lord. <clears throat> I want to start off the sermon this morning with some words from a passage in Proverbs that we will be getting to in the near future. Proverbs 9, verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. In other words, if we can understand God, if our knowledge can go beyond the basic truth that God is creator of all, all sovereign, all powerful, the great physician, our redeemer, and yet is just in all his decisions and commands, we will have a more right relationship with our God. Now I say more right here because we know through our further understanding of who God is that he had to send his son to die for us on our behalf because he was the only one who would ever live a perfect life. We cannot, nor will we ever, while we are here upon this earth, be able to have anything more than a more a right relationship with God. We will never have a perfect relationship here upon this earth. 
It just can't happen. It's not possible. But we have to strive for that more right, that more perfect relationship with him here on earth every day through sanctification, attempting to become more Christ-like each and every day. Now, when we get to that point of beginning to understand sanctification and becoming more like Jesus every day, we can proceed to the task of wisdom, learning to respect God more and more each day for who he is. So let's look at lesson number one this morning, understanding who God is. Verse 19, the Lord by wisdom, as it says in the English Standard Version, laid the earth's foundation. He founded the earth and all that is in it, in other words. Now, look back to last week, verse 13, blessed are. Those words sound very familiar, don't they? Remember the Beatitudes a few months ago? Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding. And yet, this thought might be one of the most critical, pivotal points in all the scriptures. For if you don't believe that God created the heavens and the earth, our understanding of who God is begins to lose its direction. Focus then on God's creation really means everything. God reveals who he is through his creation. Look at Paul's writing to the Romans, chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. Romans 18 alone says that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness who suppress the truth by their wickedness. The truth? Not giving credit to the creator. In fact, it's really giving credit to the created rather than the creator. Look further in Romans 1. God has made it plain to them since what can, what can be known about God has been made plain. Now think about that statement just a minute. God has made it plain to them since what can be known about God has been made plain. Why has all this been made plain to the world? Why has all of this been open to us, an open book to us? So there'll be no excuses. Verse 20. By understanding that God has established all things under heaven, it should be quite plain to all that even down to the most minute detail, God's hand has been in it from the beginning. Scientists do their dead level best to try to explain away how creation was made. The Big Bang Theory is only a TV show, folks. Scientists do everything they can to explain God away, but they can't do it. The creation God has made was made perfectly. Everything lines up perfectly. Otherwise, it wouldn't work at all. Even scientists reluctantly have to agree to that statement. In God's perfect way, perhaps through the flood, Bodies of water were divided. Even clouds, as it said, dropped their dew on the ground. It's kind of an interesting way of saying it rains, huh? But many believe that it was through the rains that caused the separation of the bodies all over the earth. Hence, the beginning of the system of rain began at that point. I, I can't begin to disagree with all that because I can't get my head around that sort of thing. I just ain't that bright. Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. In other words, happy is the man who finds his answers to life in God the Father. Happy is the man who through faith believes that God is the creator of all things. It's one of the most basic understandings we must have. The man who constantly searches for life or answers to life outside of God is the one who's going to be searching in vain. Obvious stuff for the Christian. This should be second nature to us, right? You see, man could never have invented what God did. Man could never have created what God did. It was God who created the perfect world to begin with. 
We can only create physical things. And oftentimes we don't even get that right, initially at least. On Friday mornings, in our Friday Arts Project meeting, we have at 7 a.m. at Knowledge Perk, for those who may wonder what I do at 7 o'clock on Friday mornings, there's a few of them in here, you know. Uh, we, we, I've been meeting for some time and been talking about a, a book by a guy named Dave Bouton. It looks like Dave Button, but it's Dave Bouton. He speaks about, and, and, and we discuss right deeply, I might add, far deeper than I can go, about architecture and, and uh, his and our thoughts concerning what beauty is. Or, or maybe, uh, what, maybe something less sightly, unsightly, or, or maybe even less attractive. But we talk about all of these different things and what our viewpoints are, what our opinions are. We've talked about Frank Lloyd Wright at one particular time, his architecture, and how unique much of what he did was. And yet because of his flat roofs, they had a tendency to leak at times. Not exactly perfect, is it? No matter how strongly something is built, how well something is built, there are going to be imperfections as long as man has any kind of say-so in it whatsoever. In fact, all of what man creates has imperfections and will not last. God's handiwork works in conjunction with one another. We couldn't touch it if we tried. We're encouraged in verses 21 and 22 to continue the pursuit of God's wisdom. Don't let it get out of your sight. Solomon is writing to us this morning. Pay attention and stay attentive to God's wisdom. Keep a close eye on good judgment and discretion, we're told. Why? There'll be life for us. We can wear that attentiveness proudly. Solomon says. Now how do we do all of that? We have to have that right relationship with God and it has to be a day-to-day -day pursuit for each one of us. Pursuing God's wisdom will allow us to, to attain common sense and discernment. Since the beginning of this study, we've talked about pursuing good, godly advice from those that we know and that we that we trust are in God's word. Well, you're going to hear it again this morning. You cannot talk about Proverbs and, and, and get away from that one thought. Pursue God's wisdom through a number of possible ways. Do it as it says in Romans 8.22. For if we hope for what we do not see, and we also know that is faith, don't we? We, uh, we eagerly wait for it with faith. Perseverance. Remember that word. Good John Calvin word. Perseverance. We don't see a wisdom necessarily though, do we? Someday maybe we will be able to see it come to fruition. Maybe, maybe sooner rather than later. But we'll never see perfect wisdom. Not on this earth. Not on this, in this imperfect world. But we will know what that perfect wisdom looks like when we see it. We persevere until then. Until we do see wisdom come into play. Maybe it's brought to us in someone's words. Maybe it's even as we read the scriptures, perfect wisdom comes to us or as perfect as it can be here. That's what hope is about as well. We can't see it now, but we will see it one day if we persevere through our human resources and through the work of the Holy Spirit in us. If we simply pursue God through his word or through others who know him and seek his wisdom, that's what will happen. We'll have a greater understanding, a clearer understanding of what wisdom, of what God's wisdom is. Let me give you an example of what common sense looks like or maybe doesn't look like in this particular instance. Government worker, I know, I know, don't turn me off yet. Government worker, I can't help it, it's just the example here, okay? Was cleaning, cleaning out a, a cluttered file cabinet on a Monday afternoon. <laughs> Thought maybe I'd get my hand button on my phone, on my key. I 
tahu. watching on camera this morning, don't even ask. <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> anyway, a government worker, okay, was cleaning out a cluttered file cabinet on Monday morning. There was a mountain of paperwork and files and one thing or another that he wanted to get rid of, so he was making that pile even bigger there on his trash can. He stacked them up on top of his wastebasket uh, waste with a sign that said, rubbish. Next day, the pile was still there. So he wrote another sign that said right below it, rubbish, please remove. Well, Wednesday comes along. Nothing had been done. The guy was getting a little bit ir irritated by this time. So same sign. Red letters this time, a little bit bigger than before. Rubbish, please remove, make this stuff go away. I don't want it. Thursday, as you might have guessed, it was still there. It's all the same ever-growing sign he says. Rubbish, please remove, make it go away. Get it out of here. Well, you could tell that this time there was a little bit of anger as he wrote this. Friday morning comes. Guess what? Stuff's still there. But this time, on this man's sign, there was a note attached to it that said, cannot remove unless marked trash. <laughs> Common sense. Common sense, folks. To change the word, uh, the words to an age-old song that I think we all know, what this world needs now is common sense. Sweet common sense. For ladies and a lot of guys, I guess, especially baseball players, who could probably run a whole lot faster if they didn't have five pounds worth of jewelry around their neck, especially when ladies want to look nice and, and they're going to someplace nice like to eat or, or you know something like that, let's say, what do they do? Well, they put on their best jewelry, do they not? Or they used to anyway. And guys, on occasion, that was, used to be the thing we'd give our, our, our loved ones at Christmas or birthdays or whatever the case may be. It would be something very nice to wear, jewelry of some sort. We want our loved one to, to, to feel good about themselves, to have confidence in themselves when they go out. Many may have something like that that they put on every day. Blockets, let's say, perhaps with a child's picture, could, could be anything that gave her a sense of who she was, reminding her of who she was. She is someone's mother. Rain on the finger reminds her that she is a wife. They're reminders that we belong to someone and someone belongs to us. Solomon is repeating this same thought here in verse 22. If we have wisdom and understanding, we can take and we should wear these things all the time, like fine jewelry that we might have. Bottom line, though, is we're not to, as so oftentimes happens, at least in my house, Fine jewelry like that gets put in a box in the back of the drawer, never to be seen again. We can't do that. We have to wear this daily. Let me quote you a passage from Ephesians 4 that might put it in a little bit better perspective for us today as followers of Christ. Paul says in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 4, I therefore, prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. In Ephesians 5, 
He says, to walk not as fools, but as wise, because the days are evil. Don't be unwise, he says, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You see, even 2,000 years later, and generations even between Solomon and Paul when they were here upon this earth, the encouragement has always been the very same thing. It's an encouragement through wisdom. How many of y'all know a little bit about football? <clears throat> I know Justin does. I have my reasons to know. Verse 23 reminds me a little bit about football. On offense, in order to have a productive offense, you need a good offensive line. Ask the University of South Carolina about that one. They block and protect for the quarterback so he has time to make whatever decisions for a particular play that it might take. He has to read what the defense is doing, but he's got to have a good offensive line to keep these guys off his backside, okay? If it's a running play, the, the offensive linemen have to know who they're going to be blocking or what zone they are responsible for so that they can open up an adequate avenue for that running back to make a choice and run through that particular hole in order to be able to gain maximum yardage. Well, think of wisdom and understanding along those same lines. They're our offensive line, if you will, in life. With godly wisdom and understanding, we will be able to walk in security and walk safely. In security, we will not stumble, as it says in verse 23. You could even call wisdom and understanding common sense and discernment in this case. The Lord will guide you, it says, in every step. He will be your Confidence. Now here's a, st a key statement in our reading. Verse 24. You can sleep sweetly. I saw another way of putting that. It says you can sleep soundly. Now I ask you, how many of us can sleep all night without waking up? I know, I know there's some of us older folks, nature's going to wake us up once or twice in the middle of the night, every night. But how long does it take to go back to sleep? That's the question. I can tell you, for me, it may take an hour or perhaps even two before I can go back to sleep. I start thinking about all the stuff that I have to do the next day, the places that I have to be. But invariably, I start thinking about bills, money or lack of it, problems my kids are experiencing. And yes, I think about situations we have at Hill City Church. You all are on my mind, folks, at 3 o'clock in the morning this whole time. I've been missing out in Proverbs 3.24. Rest in God's peace. It's there for us, Solomon tells us. Now, this isn't an example of sleep. If you look at Acts 16, Paul and his fellow servants of God have been arrested. They've been beaten. They've been thrown in jail. They were put, as it says in Acts, in the inner cells. I would think that probably something not along the, of the line, maybe along the lines of solitary confinement. And the jailer was uh, to keep close guard on them, or it would be his life. What were the prisoners doing? Go back and read that. They were singing, and they were praising God. And the other prisoners were listening intently, trying to figure out what in the world they were doing. Doesn't sound like there was too much concern in that jail that night, does it? It's because they were confident that God had their back. It's as simple as that. They understood that God was protecting them so that they could have slept through even the most difficult of circumstances. And they were singing and they were praising God or they could have slept. It could have been either one. It wouldn't have mattered. They knew that God was there with them and that's all that they needed. They knew, as Jesus told us in Matthew 10, 28, they were not to be afraid of anyone who can kill the body but not kill the soul. You see, 
Jesus Christ had their soul protected. There is nothing of this earth that can harm our soul. God's going to look out for those who pursue his wisdom and his discernment. You know what that does for us? Verse 25 says we can get up in the next day knowing that while God kept you safe through the night, he is going to keep you safe through that next day as well. Is that not comforting? Is that not worth being able to sleep better for? All I got to do is just remember what I said today. We can take assurances that God is indeed in control. He's a God that never slumbers nor sleeps, as we see in Psalm 121, verse 4. This same wisdom and confidence is available for us today, just as it was 2,000 years ago and beyond. I know that there's a lot of uncertainty in today's world, and we're not going to get political about that because, it, truthfully, it does absolutely no good. But look beyond what the world is offering us today. And look to what God offers us and has offered us since the beginning of time. His love and his protection. Look at what God gave us 2,000 years ago. He gave us salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. I don't know of any greater security that we can have than the blood of Jesus Christ. And the theme of the Bible has since the beginning in Genesis to the end of the book of Revelation it's all been one thing the whole time. I will be your God if you will just be my people. We need not be afraid of sudden disaster, Solomon writes to us, for the Lord is our confidence. How do we find that confidence? Through his wisdom and understanding. We have all kinds of security People are willing in our homes and in our computers today, don't we? Just about every phase of life, we've always got some kind of security that we can buy. And, and the more money we want to spend into it, the more security we can get, right? The more valuable we deem that security, the more we're going to be willing to pay for it. Solomon tells us that if the Lord is our confidence, we will not be trapped. Our foot will not be caught as it says in the English Standard Version. It's probably the least expensive, but the most valuable security we could ever have. I look at verse 27, and I, I thought this seems kind of out of place here in closing. Like maybe Solomon took a break after verse 26 and came back a bit later and started another train of thought in 27. And, and yet... I see in this one verse is one that allows others to see the love of God within each of us. Do not withhold good from those to whom good is due, Solomon says, especially when we have the power to share that good. Share the wisdom and understanding we have received from God. Share the gospel of Jesus Christ, that life-giving wisdom and understanding that the blood of Christ has bestowed upon each of us. Let others see the light of Jesus in you. Let them experience the, the good that is yours. And all the wisdom, understanding, discernment, and confidence that we have been given can be passed on to the world. Our passage today is a simple lesson passed on from father to son. <clears throat> it is, however, a lesson that we've been given by our father in heaven to pass on to the world. Are you ready to do it? Maybe the more important question would be, are we willing to do it? Let's pray. God, thank you. We praise you for another wonderful lesson from the words of Solomon. And we know that you gave him those words. But we thank you, Lord, for having instilled in him a concern for his son, but beyond that, a concern that he shares with us. Wisdom, discernment, common sense oftentimes, confidence in our security, and that is you. Bless us, Lord, 
Use us, we pray. And as we prepare to come to the table this morning, help us to take our minds back to what you've done for us, that security, that eternal security that we have in you. Bless us to that end, we ask you this morning. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Anybody come sitting up at the table, do not touch my keys. <laughs> Our catechism question this morning, question number 45. The question is, is baptism with water the washing away of sin itself? What's the answer? No. Only the blood of Christ and the renewal of the Holy Spirit can cleanse us from sin. We have the opportunity now to be able to come to the table. It's always a special, sacred time that we have each and every week. You know, our, our minds, and I think I may have told you this before, I had a friend of mine down in Florida. His name was Bob Monquist. He was an elder in my church down in Florida, but he always would tell me, I have a good memory, good and short. And I, I think, you know, we each have that same situation. We have so many things as we leave here, you know, in, in a little while, within an hour or so, let's say, just to throw it out there. But from then on until about, oh, I don't know, 9 o'clock maybe on Sunday morning when we start preparing ourselves to come to worship once again, there's an awful lot of time, about 164 hours or so, between the time we leave and the time that we come back. An awful lot can happen in our lives day to day. If your life is anything like mine, the older I get, it's not slowing down, it's speeding up. And there's so much to have to do, so much to have to remember. It's awfully hard at times to focus on the one that I need to be focused on all the time, and that's Jesus. But you know, we come to this table this morning. It's a table that doesn't belong to the ARP Church. It doesn't belong to Hill City. It doesn't even belong to the Arts Council here. I'll tell you who it does belong to. It belongs to Jesus. And he is the one who has the opportunity and the responsibility to offer an invitation to us as believers in him to come and sup with him. Spiritually, he's with us. Spiritually, we will meet him. Spiritually, we can grow as we come together to sup with him today. So this morning, and everyone is welcome to the table. If you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, please come, sit. But I would encourage you, do not partake. If you're interested, if you're intrigued, please talk to one of the elders, to myself, after the service is over this morning. We'll be glad to show you the way to Jesus Christ. But until then, watch and, and, and see the rest of us as we partake of the meal. I can't think of another way except through baptism, perhaps that we are able to be drawn any closer to Christ than we can through what we're going to be doing in just a couple of minutes. Same thing the disciples did 2,000 years ago. And as we hear the words of institution, I'm going to be using the book of Mark this morning. It's short as Mark's words usually are, but they're very powerful. I want you to listen to these words that Mark wrote to us so many years ago. It comes from Mark 14. And as they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Truly, I listen to the promise here. Truly, I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Do you know who he addressed those words to, folks? You and me. Now, if that is not a promise given to us by our Lord that we can take to the bank, I don't know what is. Consider those things this morning. The invitation is open. 
the Lord says, come, eat, drink, and be filled. 